Okay, and hopefully everybody's into the session. Welcome everybody to the annual John Paul Memorial Lecture for 2021, Innovation in Conservation. This event is brought to you by Trust for Nature with the support of the Paul Family Foundation. My name is Nikki Munro and I work for Trust for Nature in Northeast Victoria, and I will be your host for tonight. This year, we're exploring the topic of fenced reserves and their role in, in the conservation of our most threatened species. This is a topic I'm very interested in and have been for a long time, and I hope it's caught your attention too. Before we commence, I would first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country that we are all zooming in from today. Since we are joining from all over the country, well, perhaps it would be a good idea for each person to quietly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which you live and work. Tonight, I am dialing in from the country of the Yorta Yorta and Bauman, and I pay my respects to the traditional owners of the country, past, present and emerging, and I thank them in particular for their involvement in land conservation. This evening's lecture is brought to you by Trust for Nature. Trust for Nature is one of Australia's oldest conservation organisations established in 1972. Our core business is working with willing landholders to establish permanent protection on areas of very important native ecosystems on private land. This work creates a lasting legacy for future generations. This annual lecture series was established to acknowledge the impact of John Paul and his family. John was the former director of Docker Plains Pastoral Company, who sadly passed away in 2015. John Paul worked with Trust for Nature to establish Victoria's largest conservation covenant at a huge 1,100 hectares on the family property at Docker Plains near Wangaratta. It's actually just down the road from where I'm talking to you today. And this property is an outstanding example of balancing the protection for biodiversity with active farming. John was also a passionate supporter of traditional owners and his foundation gives ongoing support to the local Bangaran community. So thank you very much to Mary and the Paul family for this lecture tonight. So over the next hour we and a bit, we will hear from each of our guest speakers there will be time for a bit of a panel discussion at the end or at least answering a few questions. If you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A section of your screen and our panellists will answer some of these ongoing through the night as well as some of our Trust for Nature staff and we'll save one or two of the questions for the end. Before I introduce our guest speakers, I want to give you just a little bit of background. As you may know, Australia has a very poor record of recent animal extinctions, and much of this can be blamed on introduced cats and foxes, predating on our, local, on our native wildlife, and rabbits eating our local plants, and changing vegetation structure. The mammals, particularly the ground-dwelling mammals between sort of rat size and rabbit size, are the most impacted by predation and competition. So what can we do? Well, eradication across Australia is almost impossible at the moment, except on quite small islands. But we can create small islands on the mainland where we establish fence reserves, remove all the feral animals from inside and replace them with native wildlife that used to occur there. This is a relatively recent strategy stimulated by our appalling mammal decline and extinction. But Australia now leads the way internationally on designing and managing such reserves, with over 30 fenced reserves currently in operation. Fenced reserves may be the only current viable option for protecting some of our most threatened species, but they aren't without challenges. So now let's hear from our guest speakers on fenced reserves and how far conservation can go. So I would now like to welcome the speakers for tonight's lecture. All are leaders in their field 
who have well who have worked to find practical solutions to real world problems. I first welcome Catherine Mosby, who I had the privilege to work with in Boxby Downs in at Arid Recovery. Since she's established Arid Recovery, she's gone on to found several other projects, um, all based on conservation of threatened species, mostly in the deserts. So Catherine is a wealth of knowledge of desert ecology and has been at the leading edge of threatened species conservation since the mid 90s. Catherine has roles in both the Adelaide University and the University of New South Wales, and with her husband, John Reid, has um, her own consultancy, Ecological Horizons. Welcome, Catherine, over to you. Thanks, Nikki. Um, I'm just gonna try and share my screen and hopefully see if that works. Uh, nope, that's not the right one. Uh, here we go. Great. So I'll just put it on slideshow. Oh, why is it doing that? Sorry, hold on a second. Technical glitch. Just got to try and put it back to where we started. Oh, it's good to go first, isn't it? Just trying to get the share screen bit. Okay, I don't understand why it won't go full screen. There it is. Okay, sorry about that. Um, good evening. Uh, so I want to talk today about fence conservation reserves and a little bit about the good, the bad and the ugly because there's certainly some interesting aspects of fence reserves. So I'll get straight into it. Why do we need them? Um, you know, they're, they're pretty expensive. They're a lot of time and effort to put up. You know, how, how come we need them at all? Can we just live without fence reserves? And when you look at the history of reintroductions in Australia, apart from islands, uh, we've got a very poor history of reintroduction success outside fence reserves. So a lot of, a litany of failed reintroductions and a, a wide range of these critical weight range species. So they, they're just not really working. We keep trying to reintroduce them outside fences and uh, certainly in our arid zones, they're, they're really not surviving. And the main reason for this is, uh, well, there's a few reasons, but at least where I work in the deserts, that foxes and cats are major predators, rabbits and overgrazing. And obviously further south, that would be land clearance. So these sort of are really stopping animals from being reintroduced outside fence reserves. There has been some success um, outside fence reserves using aerial poison baiting. So Western Australia in particular, the Flinders Ranges in South Australia, um, but they've had to implement sort of poison baiting of 1080 over large areas. And in South Australia and Western Australia, a lot of our animals have high tolerance um, compared to the Eastern states where the tolerance is a lot lower. So we have had some success with that in those areas. So fence reserves, I think John Wamsley was one of the first ones to do Warrawong Sanctuary, which was one of the earliest fence reserves in South Australia and the Adelaide Hills. And um, since then, they've sort of sprung up all over the place and um, we've got more than 25 of them. Uh, they're all over different habitat types. It's quite a few in WA, but they are certainly in a lot of places throughout Australia. Um, none that I know of in Tasmania, but that, this is quite a few years old, so it might have come on since then. So we've got over 25 of them. It's, it's going up all the time, certainly has skyrocketed in the last five years and there's more planned in New South Wales um, over the next few years as well. They only cover a few, square a few hundred square kilometres though, and most of them are very small. So the median size is only 4.2 square kilometres. So they're, they're pretty small little postage stamps in a wide area of, of habitat not just confined to Australia, we find them in a whole lot of other countries. This is a mongoose fence in Japan that was um, erected to protect the Okinawa rail, which is a very threatened bird over there. So they're, they're certainly used in a lot of other countries as well, not just Australia. And the fence reserves we have in Australia can sort of be divided up into three groups. We've got the, the single species emergency intervention type fence reserves, and they tend to be for you know, critically endangered or, or single species focus. Then we've got the multiple species one where we put lots of different species in and, and try and get the numbers up you know, as high as we can. And then there's more sort of ecosystem focused 
ones where we're trying to restore the whole ecosystem and, and re-establish those natural ecosystem processes. So we sort of see different exposures in different categories throughout Australia. But I guess in a lot of cases, we see them as stepping stones. So you might start off with these insurance populations in zoos or islands, and then we move them into these sort of fenced reserves. But the ultimate aim, I guess, is to get them outside those fence reserves and into managed landscapes and get that, that widespread recovery happening. So sort of see them as a stepping stone to, to wider spread recovery. So the good, the bad and the ugly, I'll start off with the good. Um, and there's plenty of good with fence reserves, uh, otherwise we wouldn't keep building them. So obviously they work. Um, if we look at the reintroduction success of small mammals and medium-sized mammals in defence reserves, they're extremely successful. The ones that have failed have tended to fail through native predators, so things like aerial predators or pythons, that, or goannas, those sort of things. But in general, you fence an area, you exclude cats and foxes, and you reintroduce animals, and they, they, they start increasing pretty well straight away. So they definitely work from that perspective. So we co-founded Arid Recovery in 1997, which is one of the larger fence reserves in Australia. It's 123 square kilometres. It's got six compartments and we move animals between compartments and do some experimental reintroductions with different aspects of it as well. Um, and so it's been going for over 20 years now. It's probably one of the longer running exposures in Australia. And the reason we started uh, Arid Recovery was uh, when rabbit Khaleesi virus came through. I don't know if anyone remembers in about 995, it was it escaped from Wardang Island and spread across Australia. And we had a massive reduction in, in rabbits. And that really was our stimulus to, to fence off an area and try and permanently remove rabbits and cats and foxes from that area. And we had a great window of opportunity with the, with the RCD coming through. And since that time, we have reintroduced five threatened species. So the sick nest rat, the Western Bar Bandicoot, Bilby, Burrowing Betong and Western Quoll. Some of these like the Shark Bay Bandicoot and the Burrowing Betong are only found on offshore islands in Western Australia. Western Quoll has declined by more than 90% of its range and stick nest rat is only found on one island off South Australia. So these are very threatened species and we re released them and their numbers increased inside the reserve. We also tried to release numbats and wombat pythons. Um, but both of those releases failed due to predation from native predators. So not only are we seeing differences in terms of animals being in the environment, we're also changing the whole soundscape. So this is a growing betong. And when you walk around the reserve now, when you startle them, they make, they make this noise. It's, a, it's an alarm call. I'll play it again in case we missed it. Um, so... <laughs> It's quite a, a interesting call to hear at night. And then the other noise we often hear with the betongs, they do a lot of fighting between themselves. We get this sort of um, aggression noise. It's like a hissing noise. So they're, you know, they're changing the whole landscape. We, we're certainly getting a lot of changes happening. It's not just the physical animals, but, and things like um, the bilbies that we've reintroduced, they're doing a lot of digging. This one's digging for ant larvae. And those foraging pits uh, provide seed germination sites and just um, increase the water infiltration and the carbon in the soil. So we're seeing a whole lot of ecosystem changes from releasing these animals. It's not just the ecosystem. Uh, it's not just the animals themselves. Another, I guess, one of the goods of, of fence reserves is it really can help improve our understanding. So a lot of fence reserves do monitoring inside and outside. They're getting a whole understanding of how the ecosystem used to work when these animals were in it. And um, that knowledge can then be applied outside the reserve at, at, other, at other sites. So that's been a, a real key thing that we've done at Arid Recovery. We've done a lot of fauna and flora monitoring. Uh, and some reserves, not all reserves are open to the public, but if you, if you can, they've got, they're a fantastic opportunity for education and public participation. People just love coming out, spotlighting at night or being involved in releasing animals. And it's a really great way to get people back to nature and, and interacting with nature. And there's such few opportunities to do that these days. So fence reserves really play a really important role in that. So not just from conservation, but from, from education. And Arid Recovery's had thousands of groups come through. And I think that photo on the right is from Mulligan's Flat. So um, it's a bit too cold there to be Arid Recovery. So yeah, it certainly happens at other fence reserves as well. 
training and inspiring. We we have a lot of school groups. We have we've had over fifty um, PhD honors and master students come and do research there. People go on and then get jobs in a whole range of other organisations across Australia. So it's a great stepping stone for training ecologists and and training young Australians. So fenced reserves can really provide that opportunity, which uh, as an outdoor laboratory, which you know they're, they're hard to come by. Recovery does pride itself on doing a lot of research. So we've collaborated with 76 organisations, including 23 universities and published a whole lot of publications. So fence reserves do give that opportunity to, to do research and as well as just conservation. And some of that research can be really beneficial. So this is a stick nest wrap that was reintroduced to Arid Recovery. They build these amazing nests out of sticks. And just from researching them, we found that over the summer months when it gets really hot here, they, they migrate and retreat to, to Beton Warrens in the summer. So we now know that when you release these rats, we really need to have a co-release of some sort of burrowing animal in order to provide them with that thermal refuge that they need over the summer months. So this is pretty, pretty important research that can get done in fenced reserves. So the bad, it's not really bad, it's, it's more like just things to watch out for rather than necessarily being bad in particular. Um, very expensive. Fence reserves can cost anywhere from, you know, 30,000 a kilometre up to 240,000 a kilometre, depending on the design. Um, so you could easily spend a million dollars on building it, removing pests and reintroducing species. So they're, they're very expensive. And I think the thing that, that people don't realise is the maintenance and replacement costs. At Arid Recovery, we have to replace our foot netting every 15 years because it gets um, it gets rusted out by touching the sand, which is highly corrosive. So we've got a huge amount of money that we have to spend every 15 years in replacement. And then even maintenance every year, um, things happen, sand builds up on the fence, you get holes under the fence. So it is a constant, it's a really big job and it's, it requires a really high level of commitment. Fences are a barrier to cats and foxes, which is great, but they're also a barrier to a whole lot of other species as well. So they stop kangaroos and emus moving through the landscape. We get bird strike and reptile death from entanglement. Um, they prevent natural dispersal of animals inside and animals outside. So, you know, when you're thinking about a fence reserve, you really have to think about the impacts it might have on the in situ species and, and how you might be able to reduce them because there are definitely some of those negative consequences of, of putting a, a barrier up to a lot of species. Naivety, so you take away predators and you release animals that then don't have any exposure to predators and you end up with very naive animals that are not going to cope well when you want to release them outside reserves or they're not going to cope well um, in other natural situations. So you have to be very careful in fence reserves that you don't just perpetuate and exacerbate prey naivety, which is due to that lack of co-evolution between these species and, and cats and foxes. So certainly something to be aware of trying to have predators in the system. Inbreeding and loss of genetic diversity, um, the smaller the reserve and the smaller the effective population size, the greater the risk of inbreeding and, and um, losing your yeah, heterozygosity. So it's yeah definitely an issue with fence reserves and, and we need to look at doing genetic swaps. We've just recently done some adding new genetics for our bilbies, but it's a, a constant issue that you need to be on top of and, and be monitoring and, and implementing unless you have a, a very large reserve. I think something that maybe people don't often realise is that some species don't benefit from fence reserves. So we measured a whole lot of in situ species, so little native rodents and little native reptiles inside and outside our reserve. And on the left there is the inside and the dotted line is the fence. And a lot of these animals are, are more abundant outside the reserve than inside the reserve. And this could be because you know, the, some of the reintroduced species like the bilbies are eating them. It can also be what we call trophic cascades. So when we got rid of the cats and foxes, the goanna numbers increased and goannas love to eat small reptiles. So that's also had a, an effect. So, you know, you build a fence, but not necessarily every species is going to benefit from that. So something worth thinking about before you put the fence up. And then we come to the ugly. So this is more ugly as in not ugly animals, but ugly situations. And one of those is overpopulation. So this is when you get too much of a good thing. And we've got an example here, arid recovery with our burrowing betong. 
where the numbers have increased to proportions where they damage the vegetation. So you remove, remove predators and animals thrive. We went from 30 bedongs to over 6,000 in 16 years. And that number just started having a huge impact, browsing impact on our native vegetation. These trees on the left are native plums, which is a, a beautiful grove species that's really drought tolerant, um, completely defoliated by bedongs. And you can see as the bedong abundance went up, the vegetation damage also increased. So it became a real problem as to what to do with all these animals. And it doesn't just happen in Australia, it happens all over the world. This is an example of a fenced reserve in the Netherlands where they introduced a whole lot of large herbivores and let the numbers build up and they had a mass starvation event, um, which is obviously an animal welfare issue um, in such a small reserve. So one of the things we're trying to do is add native predators to see if we can control all these bedongs. Um, you think a quoll might not be big enough but these are quite formidable predators and they certainly eat bettongs. Um, but again, when you introduce a predator, you need a large area to support a large number of predators. I guess the other ugly situation with fence reserves or muddy situation is this halo effect. So this is the, the thinking that you animals build up inside the reserve and then they self-release outside and then you end up with a, a beautiful halo around your fence reserve where the, the animals are surviving outside. We actually tested this arid recovery with our threatened species. So most of them can get out either as juveniles or they can climb over the fence. And we didn't have a halo for any of the reintroduced species at all. So they were climbing out of the fence, but they weren't surviving. We even released some outside the fence and they weren't surviving. So um, you know, there are examples of halo effects, mostly in birds in New Zealand, where they've emigrated out into the suburbs. So, you know, that sort of gives us hope that we can get to that point. But when you look at the um, examples in Australia, we really don't have good examples of halo effects here. These are the only two halo effects that we did detect. These are two native mice that are just naturally found inside the reserve and they've increased since we got rid of the cats and foxes. And the dotted line is the fence. So high numbers on the left, and you can see a small halo effect that extends out only a couple of hundred metres for the plains mouse uh, and maybe, you know, a kilometre or so for the, for the hopping mice. So, you know, the, the, there is hope that we can get there, but it's, it's very difficult to, to prove that it's going to work. So in terms of a vision for fenced reserves, I think it's really great to have these conversations and it would be great to have them at a national level as well. Like where do we want to go to with these fenced reserves? So in my opinion, we want large naturally functioning areas where natural processes can be maintained and animals can continue to evolve and adapt. Um, and in order to do that, I think if you want to have an effective fenced reserve in that vein, there's a few things you need to think about. So. Firstly, you want to make sure that you get a fence that's been tested or test your own fence. Um, and there are fences that have been tested and two of the main ones have this um, curved top on them. The one in New Zealand has a, has a fixed top and the one in South Australia has a floppy top, but they both have that same curved design. There may well be better fence designs out there, but I think if you know, either need to test one yourself or, or use some existing fence designs that you know are going to work. And you really need to, to implement an effective incursion plan because you will get feral animals getting in at some point uh, through a hole in the fence or over the fence or, and you need to be ready. You need to have a plan in place because Paris uh, and Prong in WA had a fox get in and within three months it wiped out, you know, almost wiped out their entire band food population. So things can happen very fast and go wrong very quickly. I personally feel that you should remove all feral, feral herbivores, so rabbits and goats and that sort of thing, and really be careful of macropods because macropods are particularly bad for overpopulation. They have a very fast growth rate. They're not able to self-release very easily compared to other species and um, do seem to have issues with overpopulation in that particular group of animals as well. You also need to really, if you want to maintain or improve animals' ability to adapt to climate change or other threats, you need to have big reserves. You need to have natural population fluctuations. And arid recovery animals during drought decline, but then they bounce back again. And, and that's what you want to see. You want to see a natural fluctuations in population that, that don't lead to overpopulation or, or catastrophic decline. 
really part of that is about limiting your supplementary water and food. If, if you're providing supplementary water and food, you're probably setting yourself up for overpopulation because you're sustaining those populations at a level higher than they would naturally be there. And this is a really difficult issue with fence reserves, particularly small fence reserves, because sitting there and letting animals die during a drought is not something people want to do. And there's animal welfare issues. And so I think this is a, a topic that needs a lot more discussion around Australia and, and how we're going to solve this. Because if you keep adding food and water at, at, you know, in large amounts, you're basically creating a zoo situation and then your ecosystem starts to decline in its, in its um, condition. Uh, and if you want to restore ecosystem function and have a functioning ecosystem, you've got to make sure all of your trophic groups are represented. So you want to make sure you've got your predators, your competitors, your detritivores, your scavengers. You want to really try and get animals from a wide range of those trophic levels. Um, and you also think about your order of reintroduction. So you want to get your ecosystem engineers in first. They're going to dig your holes that your stick nest rats can shelter in in summer. They're going to sort turn the soil over and increase your, your vegetation recovery, that sort of thing. So thinking about what order you're going to put animals in is, is really important. And don't forget what's already there. And in some cases, when people talk to me about whether they want to put a fence reserve in, they've already got a pretty special species there. And so you don't necessarily need to reintroduce things. You can just protect what you've already got. Um, a lot of the native species are going to respond amazingly from removing cats and foxes. Um, so you don't necessarily have to add anything else to the equation. You can just protect what you've already got through fence reserves as well. And this we touched on, touched on before about dispersal, not only within the reserves, so about having a large enough reserve to allow young animals to disperse freely and not sort of get stuck in the home ranges of their parents, but also having leaky fences that allow them to, to get out as well and hopefully survive outside the fence if you can get your predator control down long enough. So make sure you put reserves where you can expand out or if you can get a halo effect to work. You know, if they're surrounded by agricultural land, then it's going to be it's going to be difficult. And lastly, choose wisely. So fence reserves are certainly suited better to some species and some areas. Smaller species definitely, so you can get that viable population size up. People talk about 500, it's a bit of a magic number, but you certainly want to have you know, large numbers if you can to allow that fluctuation. You want species that can get out through your fence, you're going to have a lot less issues with um, overpopulation if they can self-disperse. Large areas, Rainfall is a big one. Wherever you have hilly areas or areas with high rainfall, you have creek lines and drainage lines and they're very difficult to fence. You're going to have huge issues with incursions every time you get a rainfall event. Some work they did in New Zealand found uh, incursions happen can happen within 30 minutes of getting a hole in the fence. So things can happen pretty quickly and go downhill pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, be careful of macropods and um, because of that long-term maintenance issue and fence replacement issue, you really need to have that long-term funding secured before you start. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Catherine. That was fantastic. I had such a wonderful time working with you in Roxby at Arab Recovery. It was so amazing to be witness to the return of bilbies and betongs and stick nest rats. But, oh, my goodness, that damage to the native plums there was something. Um, thank you. Um, I just want to remind our listeners that if they have a question, to type it into our Q&A. That would be lovely. And now we'll come to questions at the end um, other than those that are being asked. So now I would like to welcome Adrian Manning. So Adrian is a professor. Uh, in ecology at the Venice School for, of Environment and Society at the Australian National University in Canberra. And Adrian and I, and I worked together at Mulligan's Flat Woodland Sanctuary in the ACT, where we did a project on the role of betong digs in turning over soil and ultimately the role of digging marsupials in restoring ecosystems. Welcome, Adrian. Thanks, Nikki. share my screen there. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, Mulligan's Flat Woodland Sanctuary, um, which didn't start out as a fence sanctuary, but had been reserved 
as a result of the community um, campaigning for um, a nature reserve. <clears throat> and we were asked in, in the first instance to come in and do some research on the ecosystem, the way to improve the ecosystem. And then the whole project snowballed to the point where we built a, a, a predator-proof fence, a sanctuary, and then that allowed us to do reintroductions and so forth. So Mulligan's Flat is in the north of uh, the ACT. It's um, largely what's called critically uh, endangered box gum grassy woodland. We've got about, um, it's about 1600 hectares and we've got 1200 hectares in predator proof sanctuaries. The original sanctuary that everyone knows is the 485 hectares uh, around Mulligan's Flat. So we've had a partnership there for about 16 years, starting with the Mulligan's Flat Guri Roo woodland experiment. And then uh, they developed the idea of a predator proof sanctuary uh, and an independent trust that works with us in the government. And we've also been, we learned from uh, Arid Recovery and visited Catherine and the team over there back in 2006, and also Zealandia in, uh, in Wellington that sort of informed our thinking about how we would create our sanctuary. And more recently, collaborating with, with Odenata. Um, and one of the key things about sanctuaries is, uh, I think they're as much about people as they are about animals and nature. And it's about the relationship of people um, <clears throat> and their local place. Uh, and it's really important that people feel a connection and are involved in, in sanctuaries. And we see um, Mulligan's Flat, a lot like Arid Recovery, about restoring the ecosystem, but also learning as we do this and then inspiring others. And if, you, if we think about sanctuaries in Australia, places like Arid Recovery inspired us to create a sanctuary at Mulligan's Flat. And now we're involved in creating sanctuaries elsewhere. So it is really a catalytic um, a process of creating and supporting sanctuaries and learning from each other. <clears throat> So when we think about where, where does Mulligan's Flat sit, we kind of see ourselves in, in, in the center of a, a, a continuum from the, the, the large open wilderness areas and more conventional zoos and open range. We are animals live essentially as wild in Mulligan's Flat. And it's really a place where we are in terms of reintroducing species, rebuilding populations of its in-situ species, hopefully improving conditions and as, uh, as Catherine mentioned, was talking about, they're actually a stepping stone um, back out into the wild beyond, beyond the fence, as we sometimes call it. Um, and of course, beyond the fence is really challenging and there's a lot of work to be done there. So sanctuaries uh, sit in that place between captive populations and refuge populations where we rebuild, we learn, we train animals so that ultimately we can, we can get them out, out there, back it back. Uh, beyond the fence. <clears throat> now, one of the uh, key things that we think about when we're thinking of Mulligan's Flat, we we've, we've, we've think about the loss of species in the ecosystem. And this is something, this causes something called shifting baseline syndrome, which basically comes from fishery science. And this is the idea that our benchmark for the environmental quality is based on how the environment was when we grew up or when we were young and we were learning. And this example here from fishery science uh, when populations are good, fishery scientists benchmark good populations. So if you're a fishery science here in the North Atlantic looking at cod, this would be a benchmark. If you're a fishery science in the 2000s, your benchmark would be different. And it's the same thing in ecosystems. So um, if you, uh, we have our own shifting baseline uh, in places like Mulligan's Flat, where we've lost species since the 18, 1800s. And our idea is how can thinking about how we can reverse that shifting baseline. And as Catherine was talking about rebuilding the trophic relationships, the food webs, we think about Mulligan's Flat as a food web, and we're we're putting animals back into that food web to make to improve the function, and also managing the uh, the existing in situ vegetation and and species as well as part of that. So in our original experiment pre fence. We worked with the ACT government to look at ways of improving the woodlands. We added 2000 tons of dead wood. Um, we burned some areas uh, with controlled burns with the help of the ACT government. 
we controlled kangaroos with uh, exclusion fences. So we had kangaroos in some places and not in others. So we could look at that, that effect. And then over the last 16 years, we followed the ecosystem and the response of the ecosystem to the different treatments. Now, as we built the partnership with government, we started to think about building predator proof fence. And that's where Mulligan's Flat Woodland Sanctuary, the idea of Mulligan's Flat. And you might see that fence is a bit familiar because it's essentially the fence from our recovery adapted to a woodland setting. So there's an example of how we how we learned. We built that fence in 2009. And what that allowed us to do then was to think about reintroducing species that couldn't otherwise uh, come back. And we've been, uh, since 2009, been experimentally reintroducing species to Mulligan's Flat. And also Mulligan's Flat is a great place to take people um, decision makers and show them what's possible and not just talk about Mulligan's Flat, but talk about sanctuaries around Australia and talk about conservation. And when we're uh, doing our uh, reintroductions, we, we, look at, we look at what we do as, as different tactics for success. And we try different tactics, once we focus on animals, on the animals themselves, the genetics, um, the behavior, and also the environment, how can we manipulate the environment? We try things, if things don't work, we try something else. And that's the way we try to think an adaptive approach to our reintroductions. So with the um, Eastern Beton, um, we, uh, when we started, we didn't know exactly which Beton uh, was um, in our area, but what we do know is they were highly abundant. So you couldn't plant potatoes in the district around Mulligan's Flat because uh, Betongs were so abundant and you can imagine the turning over the soil the size of that process that would have been there so once we'd identified the eastern beton which luckily for us was still in tasmania we um, um we brought it back from tasmania and uh, we didn't want to just bring the animal back but we wanted to bring the processes that were associated with it so we started an adaptive process after identifying the beton and it took us three years from that point to actually reintroducing them into Mulligan's Flat. And there's a lot of trial and error in that, uh, as there are in the, other, in the other sanctuaries. And then once we reintroduced the Betong, we've had a program of monitoring the population, how things have changed through time as the population is built, and also the impact on the ecosystem. Um, and including the work that Nikki was talking about that we collaborated on looking at that lost ecosystem process that the Betongs brought back. And then building on our learning from the Eastern Betong, we've gone on to reintroducing species like the Eastern Qual. Uh, and and um, second from the left is Belinda Wilson, who is our PhD student who's worked on the reintroduction of uh, the e Eastern uh, Qual. Now I was mentioning our tactical framework, and this is how we improve success at Mulligan's Flat. And in the first instance, when we first released the Eastern Qual, we brought 16 animals in, uh, eight, captive animals um, from Mount Rothwell and eight, eight wild animals from Tasmania. And in that first season, we brought uh, males and females in pre-breeding and we only had 50% survival. And this was because the males fought with each other and went over the fence and some were predated by foxes. So we, we, we looked at what happened there and we thought, well, what can we change to improve it? So the following year, we brought only females in with pouch young uh, we didn't bring any males in and we brought them after the breeding season. So when they were no longer um, fighting and there was um, um, arguments between animals and the result of that shit, just one change in tactic was 92% survival. So from 50% to 92% just by changing tactics. And in the third year, similar sort of rate. So that's how we do this learning process that improves the quals. And now the, the quals are doing very well in Mulligan's flat. Um, based on that, those initial tactical uh, changes that we made. Now we're also working on other species such as New Holland mice and Eastern chestnut mice. The interesting thing about these species is they disappeared so long ago that we didn't even know we'd lost them until colleagues uh, like um, Fred Ford looked at the, um, the deposits in caves and realized that these were actually widespread through woodlands west of the dividing range, but they, they had completely gone and they went very early, earlier than quals and betongs. So we've been looking at bringing them from their refuges, in this case, the New Holland mouse, 
doing trials at Mulligan's flat, looking at different ways, leaky fences and different, idea, different ideas to help us get them back firstly in sanctuaries and then in the long-term thinking beyond the fence. Now, as part of the development of Mulligan's flat, um, the, the uh, partnership has continued to develop uh, and we've recently put together a strategy that takes into account everything that we've, we've learned and our learning and how we are building and thinking about the future. So we've got a strategy taking us to 2045. And in that strategy, we're starting to think about new species that we might consider reintroducing or at least conducting pilot research that would then inform restoration in other places in our region and around Australia. And uh, uh, Catherine's mentioned um, Zealandia in, in um, New Zealand. They're starting to get, think beyond the fence there where animals, uh, birds have spilled out into the neighboring suburbs and they've really inspired the people living around the area of uh, Zealandia. Kaka and other birds are going there and people are starting to do pest control in suburbs uh, to support uh, the species. And of course, um, uh, Catherine's talked about all their work which inspires us to think about beyond the fence in our setting as well. And we've got our own pioneer at, uh, at Mulligan's Flat, Phil the Bushstone Curlew. He's got a GPS backpack on. Uh, uh, we've got a PhD student, Shoshana Rapley, who's developed the means of putting GPS backpacks on Bushstone Curlews. And now Phil and his, uh, his fellow Bushstone Curlews go and spend time. This is New South Wales, just over the border pops over the border, has a little bit of a look around, comes back to Mulligan's flat. So they're doing it themselves, exploring, learning. There are foxes in this, in this landscape beyond Mulligan's flat and they are learning about foxes and then they can come back into Mulligan's flat. So it's as, it, as the idea that it's, a, it's a, a stepping stone or a safe haven for them where they can explore beyond the fence. And we've also done some pilot work with Eastern Bedongs, looking at ways in which um, Bedongs can survive beyond the fence, building those stepping stones to the point where perhaps one day we can have Bedongs throughout the landscape if we can develop the tactics and the techniques necessary. So based on what we've done at Mulligan's Flat, we am working with the trust. We, uh, we do a lot of science communication about um, about what we do and how we learn and importantly giving people opportunities like twilight tours to, to go out and experience nature for themselves and that is a really important part of how we our philosophy at Mulligan's Flat is that there are many different ways of experiencing Mulligan's Flat and getting a sense of what it would have been like to to walk through these woodlands say 150 years ago so getting everyone's individual shifted baseline back up a higher baseline then we then we think about the people x are expecting more they can either go back to um other places in canberra or around the country and say why can't we have this here and this is the way we want people to think think about um nature and restoration so uh the, the woodlands and wetlands trust has an, an amazing uh, science communication program in, uh, we we've had um hand raised betongs for, to take into schools to show them with, with uh, so children, we have uh, media coverage. And in fact, this story here, recent story about echidna trains uh, in Mulligan's flat had 6 million views. So that's been seen all over the world, talking about Australian conservation um, and telling the story of restoration. Um, and one of the things, this is one uh, when we first brought betongs back from uh, Tasmania, this is at our at Tidbinbilla Nature Reserve where we had an insurance population. We had a, um, this is our first young betong. We were very excited about this when it first happened, the first pouch young that had emerged. And um, the staff down there called him Stuart Little. He was really a, a real, real character. And we realized then that the power of an animal like a betong to encapsulate the whole idea about the restoration of the ecosystem. And also um, with, here's our quals. This is just after the release of the quals. Um, and we put this uh, bit of footage on social media and got a lot of views on social media. And you can see the power of being able to engage people and show them something that they would not otherwise have seen. 
Um, and these, these eastern quolls um, got a lot of attention in this video, got a lot of attention showing you what our native fauna looked like when they're, when they're out there. You wouldn't otherwise see them. And then um, the um, taking everything that we've um, we've been building through Mulligan since 2004, 2005, the next stage was we were, we were thinking about, well, how do we continue to build um, that experience and that engagement with the community? And, and our next step, um, working with Odenata, who we've been collaborating with on conservation projects, but now thinking about having a meeting place where people can come and find out about the research, not just at Mulligan's Flat, but all other sites, um, such as Mount Rothwell and the other sites around the country. So our next step in our journey, if you like, at Mulligan's Flat is the construction of the Woodland Learning Centre, which is, is, um, is almost complete now. And this is a place where ourselves, the researchers, the managers in the park service and the trust will we will we'll work there together and the community will be able to come and hear talks about um, about what we do in Mulligan's flat. This will be the point where people will take night walks um, we will also have lectures for students from university we will host media events. There'll be some opportunities to meet um, some of the fauna um, there. And really, uh, we're thinking about how we can um, really engage people um, in any way possible to tell them the story and, and think about, show them how we can raise that shifting baseline. And we're now at the point where, as I say, we're, we're almost complete and we will have a home where we can tell our story about Mulligan's Flat. And this will be where we will build um, <clears throat> in the, uh, the extended sanctuary, which is Guru Ryu. Guru Yaru next door to Mulligan's Flat, which is our next 800 hectare um, sanctuary. And as you saw at Arid Recovery, once you start with one sanctuary, you can build, you can make them bigger. And that's what makes it possible for you to do more things, have bigger populations and experiment with new ways of improving the ecosystem. And that's our story so far. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much, Adrian. It really gets me thinking that when we go into national parks, I often look at them and wonder what they would be like 200 years ago and just how different they would be. And I really love your thoughts that projects like Arid Recovery and Mulligan's Flat are stepping stones to other projects, um, which then multiply across the country. And for everybody listening, Adrian himself has gone on to work on other projects and to expand and has done a fair bit of work with our next guests. So I would now like to welcome Annette Rapalski and Sam Marwood. So Annette is the Biodiversity Director of Mount, at Mount Rothwell Reserve near Geelong, which is currently the largest predator-free reserve 